title, you might all have read it, I hope, or maybe read it now. Rules of Engagement and the Philosophical Framework for Aesthetic Political Influence on Historiography. Now comes the catch. I will not offer you a full framework, obviously, or I don't think I have that, but I have some thesis. Or I have, I have a framework, if you can call it that, some form of coherentism, then epistemology, or then applied to, the, to historiography, but I'm not sure if you're convinced that or it is really can be called a framework in any wide sense. Anyhow, um, so what did I want to talk about today? Well, first I want to give you sort of politi politics and political positions of historians. Obviously, if I talk about political influence on historiography, I should give you some working notion of what politics is and what political influence is perhaps and political ideologies. And um, then I give you some sort of signpost political positions of historians. I think they're very reasonable positions nobody disagrees on the relationship between historiography and um, politics. But I think these positions are very abstract and we need to do the legwork actually to find out how politics influences or doesn't historiographical reasoning practices and so forth. There is a second point up here. Um, I will try to do that a bit or give you an indication that politics, how it influences the choice of subject matters of historians and the justification of historiographical knowledge claims. Um, my general claim is that it's up that uh, political influence can be very positive on subject matters. It should um, be kept out of a very narrowly construed understanding of justification of epistemic knowledge claims about the past. This is the general theory, uh, the general thesis. And I also had a, I had a sort of another point about what I call the metapolitical interest of all historians. I think every historian, when they want to keep their historian's hat on, have certain political interests that they could fall. It's called so metapolitical interest, no matter if they're Marxist or maybe in fascist, man, that's a that's a broader case there. Anyhow, and that these interests sort of overlie with, with, with the with the values of deliberative democracy. So what, what deliberative democracy is, but I'm not gonna go into that. But I have a paper on that in the in Faravit, and that's out already. So we may well we can talk later about it, maybe. Then of course, um the title of the workshop, the philosophy of history. Uh, uh, the future of philosophy of history in relation to practice and maybe in relation to um, research about politics. And here I'm going to just talk what is called empirical turn. I think we should look more at historiographical practices like Adrian said just before. Right, so i um, give you a little definition of politics. Um, I think politics is basically about how we should live and collectively and how we should make coll collective decisions. My most broadly it's about the goals of collective living, the process and the arenas. I think every sort of political theory has these three um, uh, things covered, and then you have very different understandings. Maybe you're demonistic as the goal, like the good life, but then uh, or uh, process processual, like how do you come to conclusions? And um, then maybe as the arena of the state, but of course the, the private is political was a, a good notion. I was a notion here, so it can be different. So I give you just a textbook definition of politics mm -hmm. here. Um, it's the collective organization of communal life. And then the second one you can read yourself, but just how people make collective, preserve, amend, and make the general rules. It's not so important the definition because I want to talk about um, political ideologies, social philosophies. That's what historians actually hold, different ones. But it's important to think that politi politics is about should, ought, and probably also must. It's about future oriented, it's about action, will, power, not primarily or solely a knowledge oriented discourse, as much of science perhaps is, or maybe should be, I'm not sure. And then and an example here is, of course, COVID. Things had to be done under very uh, unfortunate knowledge uh, sort of circumstances. And, you know, there were probably only bad decisions to be able to be taken. Anyhow, so the, you have it in the, in, in the end here too. Politics is about expediency and conflicting interests, combating needs, different ones, rival opinions. And the catch here is we might not have a good um, methods of actually sorting it out, which one is correct in this value. So at least I don't know them very well. Maybe political values are not. Or some of them, or some decisions really are not rationally ad adjudicable, or there's no good warrant at one level, perhaps. Um, also, I don't, one important distinction is politics is not violence. There's, there's still some kind of commonality and some way of talking to each other. Um, and what I want to talk about here is um, um, there are very different sort of social philosophies. That is sort of the neutral term. People call it political ideologies. That would be more sort of the negative term usually used. Liberalism, conservatism, socialism, fascism, feminism. Interestingly, socialism and, fa and some sort of forms of feminism, at least, have also an um, scientific theory attached to them that has political import and political needs, like Marxism or post-structuralism. They're supposed to be 
theories and sort of also epistemic theories, but they also give you a political edge to them. Um, now, what, what, what these political social philosophies are, I'm not going to go that in any detail, but they are obviously very basic commitments, factual statements, value, and they are often essentially contested, they're not the, the meaning of them. The interesting part is um, historians have hold, ha held all of the above before and reasonably hold them now too, still again, some of them at least do. And how do they influence their work? That is the um, idea. Uh, and here I only want to say, um, we don't know well enough. There's the social, we, we, would, we, we need a sociology of historiography. We would need quantitative analysis here. Many historians also proclaim they're unpolitical. At least I heard some historians say they're unpolitical. There's nothing wrong with that. And in the history of historiography, there have been shifting alliances. 19th century nationalism is a bit of a simplified tale. 20th century Marxism. Today, historians hold very different positions. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, historians are political. They sort of intervene all the time. Timothy Snyder and Timothy Garten Ash on the Ukraine war. Um, Hobsbawm and Scott, Marxist and feminist, uh, Fernand Brondel, and it's not Friedrich Engels, it's uh, David Engels, they're on the right of the, uh, Brondel was late in his life on the right of his political spectrum. And sort of self-reflectively, Yoni Matikuka and Avi Taka have also pronounced, state, made, made statements about the Ukraine war. So it quite, we could also ask ourselves how our, political, how our work is influenced by political beliefs and what we believe politically and uh, both ways. Um, and this is sort of the common sense starting points I want to talk about. I will only go very quickly through them, not reading the quotes, perhaps. Um, I think historians, like everybody else, we're basically so, uh, historically determined. What we think, believe, want, and so on has a historical component to it. We are what we are because the way we grew up and in the society we grew up. It might be some sort of ontological historicism here. Some things are just what they are because of their history, others might not. But of course, historians also have disciplinary education that sort of is thought of as sort of disembedding ourselves from our beliefs, everyday folk beliefs, maybe. Um, and sort of historians have special uh, specific interests, is the um, Richard Evans quote, um, and purpose and inspiration present there. That's all fine, but I think these are the very general claims I want to get beyond. We all agree on these, fine. And there's a certain exasperation, but in myself with these very general claims in maybe the philosophy of history and also beyond. There's also something um, philosophy should, uh, historiography shouldn't be subsumed under politics. There's sort of, um, they sort of, um, we shouldn't, and most people agree that sort of historiographic politicism, everything is just politics and whole historiographic questions are political questions decided by political po positions of values is wrong. Vulgar Marxism, Keith Jenkins as postmodernists have held this position, but I don't think many people hold it nowadays anymore. And of course, I'm not going into it, but also I'm not, I'm not arguing that historiography or science can answer all our questions, or the other way around. So I'm not arguing for scientism here either. But the basic point is historians have all held a very different political ideologies in the past. They are all socially determined as we all are, and part of that is political. But they are not, their work is not fully determined politically. That would be the historiographic politicism. So where, where does that uh, leave us? And then we have a bit of a more involved claim, and that is um, Joan Scott. You probably know her. She's a famous historian. She has this book, Gender and the Politics of History. And she does a lot of other stuff, has done a lot of other stuff. But she comes out there with a feminist commitment. She wants to reduce inequalities between men and women. But she also says um, historiography, feminist historiography needs a more radical epistemology. And then she has this specific post structuralist account of that, which emphasizes power, difference, um, and um, the political character. And that uh, politics is just uh, conflict and everywhere. Politics is everywhere because conflict is everywhere. So conflict is also very central. That sort of account is in the end there. But what is interesting here is more concretely, um, she, she thinks that her political, her political feminism also changes the premises and standards of scholarly work, traditional notions of historical significance, and it gives us a new historical objects, personal experiences. And this is something we can work with now because this is a more concrete stuff than just we all politically determined. And I think this is correct on one level, very obviously, political positions are stimulus for historians. And Joanne Scott makes a very good argument that many feminist historians, especially in the past, when women were not allowed into the historical profession yet fully, were feminists first and then they became historians. So there's this, 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 this sort of trajectory. There are plenty of other examples, black history, social history, they are by working class, by black people and so forth. So minorities, um, disenfranchised and oppressed minorities. 
And they do change the premises and standards of the discipline in one, in one particular sense. Um, they change what is considered significant. For instance, if historians held the great man theory of history, that only men make history and only the great man, presumably, not even the working class man, and that is significant, then this claim is challenged by saying women also have history or that sort of stuff. But I'm not, I haven't got my head around, but I'm not entirely sure how this claim is in itself justified. Only great men make history. It's my, it's my sort of belief at the moment that this is justified mostly politically and by values anyway. So you have a political position that sort of uh, questions or refutes a political position. Um, and obviously with new subject matters come new theories and models often. And as there comes new evidence, nobody wanted to look at 19th century domestic diaries of women. Once you're interested, you look at that. And you have new ways of looking at all the evidence. So women appear in, in court records or even in parliamentary sessions of the 19th century as objects. Maybe you can infer something about women from them, about them, from them. There's great, there's positive influence of political positions, or at least feminism in that sense, on historiography. And of course, also as an influence on breaking up the actual political sociological structure of a, of a very manly and main, male dominated um, discipline. But now comes the catch. Um, I think that when it comes to the justification of knowledge claims about the past, politics plays not much of a role. And that co comes out of my understanding of how we justify knowledge of the past. And the general understanding is coherentist. So we justify beliefs by other beliefs. There's a certain circularity there. But um, so empirical testing is always indirect. And we, I mean, you probably know most of that. And there's, so there's no simple refutation or confirmation of simple falsification. And the question is about the justification of our, in, in our web of beliefs for the interrelation of beliefs. And the real action here is sort of done. Uh, uh, Adrian also used iterative today. I'm happy I have it here too. The real action is the iterative process between theory and empirical evidence or observation. The past is not here anymore. We need to live with its traces. So the question is, how can we reliably infer beyond the Im immediately perceived something that has existed in the past, happened in the past, and how can we make that? How can this be made sense in the light of evidence without incurring any forms of circularity? So that, that, that the theory we want to prove gives us uh, also gives us sort of um, also, is also um, involved in how the evidence is, is is understood. Then you can have a circular. So and then the question is, what theories are actually needed in historiography for that sort of um, epistemic process? Is, is our political, ethical beliefs and uh, values part of that process? And I think narrowly conceived they are not. Um, well, that is what I said, the past is gone, but we have left the traces, or once traces become theoretically understood a bit, they become evidence. From, mm. And now the historical method or the rules of evidence, call it also source criticism, modern version of the term is information evaluation. I like the term information very much, much I have sort of information, epistemology, maybe or ontology even. Anyway, but to sort of assess historical evidence, we need information theories. So we need to assess the reliability in, 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 in history, it's usually called authenticity. Or, or and the fidelity of the evidence. Well, that means that it has come to us without distortion into the present. So, so there's this um, kind of um, track of evidence that comes, that reliably connects the object of the past to the present without distortion. Um, and then the question is, of course, are there commonalities and correlations that we have in the present? You know, there are a lot of, I don't know, there's a lot of descriptions of the Battle of Stalingrad. Are they um, tokens of a common cause, the Battle of Stalingrad? And, um, and this we ascertain through information theories and, 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 and criteria. And these criteria are epistemic values, I think. So, I mean, there are values, obviously. I mean, there are values in, in, in this thing as well, but they're not political values. Or political values are somehow externally part of it because we might want to have a politically and otherwise as heterogeneous community as possible so as to give, give us good, good, good justification. But that's in sort of then it's a meta value for the whole process. It's not intrinsic to the process. And the criteria for uh, assessing inference and theories about the past are something like um, uh, co corroboration for independent evidence. So we need at least independent evidence tokens. Uh, ind independent evidence types is great too. If we have material evidence and testimonial evidence, that's great, or whatever kind of evidence. Maybe, I mean, yeah, thank you. That's okay. Maybe genetic or whatever is great. We need obviously the non circularity, independence of theories from evidence. So we need, an, we need an independence of accounting claims from explanatory claims. So we need the accounting claims for the evidence. 
the theory used for the accounting claims of the evidence need to be a different theory from the theory we want to prove with the evidence. Otherwise, we would incur circularity. Um, then, of course, generally, we have this general um, um, sort of um, requirement of consistency, theoretic co coherence, co coherence with the other theories that we know to be accurate or true in, the, in our overall web of beliefs. Um, this has sometimes be also be called coherency testing, yes. Um, and of course, um, our theories, the beliefs we hold about the past need to be open for the onslaught of the futures. So discoveries, invention, internal examination, uh, examination. So, I mean, dogmatic belief systems can be very, can be very coherent, but that's, that they don't meet the onslaught of the future usually. And the people I draw on here are like, um, just if you're interested, uh, Peter Kosso, Lawrence Bonjour, Abitaka, I forgot, Paul, Paul Sagat and Adrian for this sort of uh, criteria mostly. And then I think if we have claims that are warranted in this way, which could be summarized as dynamic coherence without collusion, it likely gives us true beliefs about the past. <coughs> now, as far as I understand this process, I think no political beliefs immediately go into this model of justification for our knowledge of the past. Um, so presumably, intrusion of politics on this level of the past, would, uh, this level of, 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 of the historiographical process or the, would have a negative effect on the process. Now, um, what that means for me is however we metaphilosophically justify that process as well. So I'm not, I'm not entirely convinced how we justify this sort of epistemic values. There's a metaphilosophically interesting question how we justify those. I think this process is universal when it comes to the knowledge claims about the past. But universal, I mean, not that everybody uses it, obviously, but universal, it might, if we want to have reliable knowledge of the past, we should use to this sort of um, model, I guess. I mean, there's, some, there's, there's, there's a lot of... Um, I'm happy to also engage in wider uh, discussions about uh, simulations and models. And uh, But if we have evidence about the past, I think we should do it this way. So on that level, there's no political epistemology, whether it be black, feminist, queer, post-colonial, Marxist, national, nationalist, indigenous, whatever you have. But I'm not claiming here now that all of historiography can be sort of subsumed by this or can be understood by this model. The question is still, is an empirically open question. How far does this model bring us sort of this source and evidence centered model of historiography? What kind of claims about the past can be justified by the, by the model I just gave you? And um, in terms of underdetermination, I don't mean, I don't mean, I mean, that's global underdetermination, but that's, so in, that's not so interesting, but in terms of subject matter too. I mean, that's one thing is some claims about the past are just epistemically underdetermined. We will, we cannot know them. We don't have enough evidence. So our best sort of uh, framework for assessing evidence just fails because we don't have the evidence. So we don't have it yet. Um, then that, that, that is correct. And maybe then political ideas and beliefs make a difference. That would be a thesis sometimes. But then we have uh, what uh, so Yunus was talking about yesterday. We have the question about colligatory concepts. And obviously, I'm not saying that something like the Dark Ages, which is a very loaded concept. I mean, nobody knows, no, his, no good historian uses it nowadays anymore as far as I know, but the Dark Ages can be justified as a term through that concept, through that process. Renaissance, I wouldn't know. Um, industrial revolutions, I think positively about, then there's the Thor, capitalism and so on. Let me put just this, this is an open question. I have strong realist intuitions about some of them at least, but not all of them. And there are obviously value and political components in some of them, maybe not all of them. And this is just a general pet peeve of me. I am a bit grew tired with sort of very general claims, be they of Marxist proven proven provenance is the word, that Hobsbawm, for instance, makes sometimes, I don't know, mode of production is always the most important in, hi in, in history. And then, and I'm also a bit like Scott, like um, these, these very general claims about meaning, language, uh, difference. I don't think they give us anything in, 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 in the process of historiographical justification, maybe and even beyond the theories historians actually use. They're probably mostly middle range theories. And I think maybe for instance, this question of meaning, language and difference, I feel like they are, they are to be answered in the philosophy of language in a very broad sense, not in the philosophy of historiography. However, what I want to say here, and these three term points, like under determination, question of colligations, and maybe in the question of grand theories, maybe here political beliefs make a difference. So here maybe we decide, even though we shouldn't maybe epistemically decide because we are politically committed to something. It, five minutes, thank you, yes, great. I think it's, it's, it's even conceivable that we decide politically here and it's not bad. Maybe it's a good thing that we decide these things politically. I'm open to that. 
I sort of think it's not. That's my intuition, but we might very well be. And that already brings me to my end. Nice series. <laughs> I hope I didn't speak too fast. Um, well, so what, what, what does that mean for the philosophy of historiography, what I just said? Well, first is of course the Brandon phrase, making it explicit. Um, we should, or anybody should make explicit as far as we can, because we don't have full understanding and disclosure of our web of belief. It's not open to us. Um, what are our political beliefs and values that go into our historiography and our own work? And what is the place in it? So somebody like Timothy Snyder and Timothy Garten Ash, but also Yoni Mati and Ivy, and maybe all of us should know, once you should, should be able to answer that. So then we should obviously be honest when we are speaking as a historian, when as a political advocate, and maybe as even as an ideologue sometimes. Um, and what is behind that more theoretically is a, is, is, is a theory of historical argumentation that I think we really lack. I think as temporal beings, we are we cannot not have an understanding of the past, the projected future. I think Johan Rusen is I for that very good well. But we don't really know what are good and bad uses of the past in politics and epistemically as well. So I mean, there's some, there must be some similarity relation for a past to be relevant and so forth. But it's, I think it's unclear. And there might even be different criteria for both for the uh, for how to use them. So what we should do is look at the uses, arguments, beliefs, and so on and take detail. That is sort of the empirical term. And I'm saying something more philosophically, wider ranging. I'm not, I think there are, more, there are situations conceivable where we could have a subordination of historiography to politics, like this, this politicism in one sense. Maybe it's necessary under some circumstances, but that needs to be carefully argued for if that is the case. And of course, the really interesting or difficult question, I'm not sure if that can be answered empirically, is do we really need to have historical knowledge to so justify true belief about the past to reach our political goals? Maybe, they, maybe it's harmful depending on the goals, maybe for all political goals. And are true beliefs about the past really a requisite for the life in a good polity? It is my, my belief in a sense, maybe it's an act of faith on that level that it is. I just have this sort of rationalist and sometimes also uh, realist leanings up to a certain extent. But this is sort of the question, as sort of Nietzsche put it, of the advantages and disadvantages of history for life. I have no answer to that. And I have a final, um, I think it's a final um, slide. So more back to the point. Uh, I think there's a convergence in many quarters of the uh, philosophy of historiography that we should do more empirical analysis, which is great because I think we should also empirically look more in detail how political beliefs and ideologies influence historiography. And there are quite a few people who are doing it now who want to do it. There's HPH, like History and Philosophy of Historiography. Herman Power came up with that. There's Philosophy of the Historical Sciences. I, I used to like that. I think that's a cool approach too, looking at the different historical sciences that's having some commonality. There's the work of Yoni Mati Kukan and Wolf Kansteiner, who was missing us last week here, who did some empirical work to analyze historical texts. There's Adrian's work with also the sort of the theoretical part of it, which is called methodological localism, but there's also his actual analysis of reasoning in paleontology and from what I got from the day. Now he moved into historiography as well to do some analysis, which is great. And this is just my sort of well, again, the pet peeve, maybe, I think we should have fewer theoretically and philosophically grandiose, but unsubstantiated claims, and maybe also fewer manifestos, and also fewer general, fewer general claims about a lot of things. I think we just know too little, that's the catch, we know too little about historiography empirically. And that is the end. I might be wrong about what I say about politics and historiography, or, or about certain parts of it and its relation, but I think it's a worthwhile topic, and it's a worthwhile approach, and the worthwhile approach is both. The empirical approach that I invited you wholeheartedly to embrace. And the other thing is not this coherent this approach. I think it's a good approach too, but you might disagree. Thank you. Oh, perhaps immediately and then really afterwards. Um, I think that was first. Then my I saw you first time you were oh, using okay. my power. <laughs> well, thank you for your talk. That's an absolutely fascinating topic. I was wondering um, to which extent you might be aware of the discussion in, uh, among, in the literature on values and science on the distinction between epistemic and non-epistemic values. I know I know of the discussion, but I don't know it well. Yeah, but... so uh, one of the, I think, really important findings in that uh, debate is that sometimes these seemingly epistemic values can in fact be straightforwardly political values. So sometimes even something is called pre precision which would imply it to be an epistemic value, it actually hides a political function. 
So sometimes these categories really do bleed in. There's really uh, nice articles on this topic uh, by Phyllis Rooney, and more recently argued that there's a bit more spectrums. There are the clearer instances of, of epistemic values and the clear instances of moral political values. And this, sometimes they bleed in, but on other occasions, they're clearer examples of uh, one or the other. And I think one of the really important point, uh, like points in this discussion uh, on values is that sometimes political values can give significance to certain sets of epistemic values. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I, I'm just wanting to put a little bit of pressure on, on the clear distinction that you gave in the uh, earlier today. Oh, that you did too much. Awesome. Yes, I mean, I thank you very much. I, I will look into that. I, I agree, I mean, I think. I sort of hinted on that as well, because I think, it sounds stupid, I don't, have, I don't have a real name for that, but I think there are some political met, met, meta values that factor into in an important epistemic process too. I mean, it is good to have a very heterogeneous group coming up with a consensus about something that probably has epistemic relevance. If you have a genuinely heterogeneous group of historians, for instance, be it by gender, be it by political um, positioning, maybe even by race, whatever, what, what have you, and by, by, by also by grand theories, Marxist or not, and they agree on certain parts of historiography, or certain interpretations, that might very well be a good indication that we have that we, that we do that we have a true belief about the past. But to have that, um, to have, all, have have that representation, is something that needs to be uh, accomplished politically. Maybe up to a certain extent, sort of to get these people all in, and then teach them in the methods of history so that they do them correctly, or that these methods that that, that are source criticism. And that's maybe that links to what you said. But I, I agree. Yes. I think, yeah, let's just say I agree. <laughs> well, I'm, I think, I'm, I'm thankful for your point out. Yeah, I'm just, thank you. I, I think it was really nice discussion. I, and I, I, I have no criticism. I have a question that well, you are now, of course, focusing on politics. But what if somebody would argue that there is much beyond politics that we could insert to kind of uh, determine this what I would call like empirically uh, or cases that are far from empirical uh, confirmation. For example, what if this is an exaggeration, but what if one would argue that at some point we have to decide whether God exists or not in order to decide how certain episodes in history went? Because, because politics is in a sense worldview. Why, why not other aspects of work? Why wouldn't we insert them into this kind of model that at some point we are just have different worldviews and that affects how we reconstruct the history? Well, yes, I mean, one, one answer is probably could reconstruct that a belief about God existed. Maybe not, maybe we can't recognize it's pretty far away in the web of beliefs from just, justificatory beliefs about the past. And if it enters, but it might enter for you if, if you hold that that, that theory. I, I agree. Um, well, I guess. Um, well, it, 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 it's it's a question also um, how epistemic how epistemically determined how much evidence we have about it. if 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 we can get on without God and without that interference, then by everything else we know and what we hold, if we are historians or if we're sort of people of a certain persuasion, then that is not a good further justificatory claim to get, get into our justification. But if it's underdetermined, or if the person don't plays the game of historiography, that's very well. When people play very different game, knowledge games or whatever, or they have very different practices, not everybody. If they engage in that sort of theology, um, then it's just like with political beliefs, then they just use that on, on, on it. And it might even have some positive outcome for whatever they claim or want to do with it. I, I don't know. But yes, I think that's, yes, I meant for the answer, but yes, that's how I would answer. Carl and then Yunus. Yeah, it's a follow up, I think, on the previous two, really. Um, I'm curious on, on this take on epistemology. What would you say? Because you have a we all the time sort of constructing this true belief. And, and part of my question would be why true belief, not justified belief, is, is what you mean. But, uh, but what would you say to people like Sandalani and others that are getting situated epistemologists? Because it seems like you've, you've sort of Ignore that whole debate about knowledge, you know, regarding uh, 
I think it's a two questions one stood correctly. Um uh justified and true, yeah. I mean for me, a uh, well justified belief is just very close to a to a true belief. I make I mean that's ideological difference. I just I just make a um sort of so it's it's a it's a it's a sliding scale there, you know. I mean I mean I mean all all we we talk about not absolute knowledge, but also more reliable and more justified. And then the closer you are to very well justified, the closer you are to true belief. And then for me, truth, truth is just correspondence. The, diff, the, 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 the difficult question is not so much for me, what is truth, but how do we get to it? I think that the, the, that, is, that is the interesting question. Um, but maybe I'm, I'm sort of thoroughly naive on this, maybe. And the second was about standpoint epistemology, right? Or, 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 or justified. Um, well, obviously my justificatory system doesn't entail that. It's actually sort of not the image if it's against it. Um, well, I, something I would say is, of course, I mean, you have you. Mm, well, if 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 let's put it this way around, I'm, I'm not I'm not fully reconstructed. I don't have full good beliefs on that. Um, if you make a claim about the past, you have to do it by what is re, what is remaining of the past, of the of the evidence that that that, that, that is remaining. Um, and in that sense knowledge of the past is different from self-knowledge because ourselves or our experience of oppression, we do know up to a certain extent, I mean, it's difficult what self-knowledge is, but it's different in that sense. We don't know the past as we know ourselves. Now, a difficult question that you ask is maybe knowing, us, knowing of ourselves of oppression as a woman, for instance, features then into, a, gives us some justificatory beliefs about the past. Um, I think it does in terms of subject matter, but then if you want, to, it depends a bit on what you want to know. If you want to know whether women have been oppressed in a certain way in the 19th century, you still need to know, need to have a lot of independent evidence about this sort of oppression, and that maybe to to, to understand and recognize it, you have your own your own experience help. But I think you still run the same sort of algorithm, Mr. Strong word, the same sort of um, process over it. If that makes sense. I mean, you, you look baffled, but let's continue with that afterwards because yeah. we did a few more questions. I think then we have quick time for Adrian still. Yeah. Oh, great. Thanks. Yes, very interesting. Uh, I when you spoke about the uh, of um, investigating historiography empirically, uh, I think uh, one also gets into this question then how at what level do uh, historians usually discuss questions about politics in relation to uh, epistemology and there I was a bit surprised that you don't you didn't really discuss the quest questions about interpretation of evidence and uh, because most historians understand this as a hermeneutic process and and the whole tradition of sort of you mentioned Marxists and, and feminist schools but the idea of a hermeneutics of suspicion which has been very important for understanding questions about politics and history and and uh, and that in 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 history, there is an interpretive process in relation to evidence, uh, which is all always <laughs> in, 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 inescapable. Uh, and at, at that level, you could say that there is a question about uh, uh, saying what counts as what what is uh, what is some event in human history an expression of, for example, because no historian is interested in simply saying that, well, or at, maybe at a very basic level, say that well. September 11th, 1848 in Paris, there was street fighting and five people died. What they would be interested in is, for instance, is this an expression of class struggle, for example? And then you immediately get into a question about interpreting the evidence. And, and, and if you want to study historiography <laughs> empirically, I would say that you need to get into this level of questions about interpretation of evidence. Uh, and um, and uh, yeah, so I just wanted you, what would you think about that uh, question? Yes. Yes to the last. Of course, you need to then go into the nitty gritty of the exp of evidence. Um, but I guess all the, the, the theories you just told me about, like Marxism and class struggle, they are just one way of, 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 of a theory that you then put to work on the empirical evidence or the, the remnants of the past the evidence that you have. Um, and then you have the process by which you go. Yeah, that I think is sort of according to this um, 
area, at least often it is. And um, wait, I wanted to, to say something on this. Um, oh yeah, and I think this what what, what, what this sort of understanding of uh, that sort of you believe you justify beliefs, but other beliefs, but there should be no circularity. Yeah. That could be construed as a hermeneutic process. That is in, that is interpretation. It's just epistem on, on this epistemic level. It is so. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. My point was more that the, the, these sort of, if you think about it from a hermeneutic perspective, uh, these questions about what counts as what goes already into the identifying of evidence. Mm -hmm. So, so it's not that you first start and collect data. You collect evidence and then you try to find out what it what it means. But it's already part of the process of of trying to understand what is going on. So, uh, yeah. Well, I say, I say yeah. just be talking later, but I say one more yeah. thing: iterative process. So it, it's a yeah. cop out in a sense. Yeah, of course it goes into it. Then you see how far you get with the evidence, and then. But yeah. my my yeah, but that, it, it might be just finally. Then then I would say that does this put into question where whether there is this fundamental epistemological level that is non-political. Uh, I let you have the last word for that. <laughs> yeah, because there's another, one more question, right? Well, go with Andrew. Yeah. So I want to underline about six times Carolina's point about looking at the values in science literature because first off you know you don't want to reinvent the wheel and I think a lot of those discussions being had pretty sophisticatedly over there but I think also there's stuff in there that kind of makes the way in which you seem to be wanting to pull let's call them non-epistemic values away from epistemic values kind of implausible and I think it's implausible given your own coherence right? <laughs> if you're a coherentist and you think it's a whip of belief then you think that your non-epistemic values are going to be part of those, um, part of that web of belief. So um, I point you towards um, Elizabeth Anderson's work. So um, she, what um, she would translate what you're saying is roughly, um, you know, we want to have impartiality, which is just to say my non-epistemic values had better not determine the truth of what I'm doing. But that's it, right? <laughs> um, these values are going to be suffused in lots of ways. And in particular, what she says that I find really convincing is that non-epistemic values are sensitive to the world, right? So um, uh, political, moral, um, aesthetic values don't float free of um, our experience or the empirical world. They're part of this web of beliefs. And so the move of going, <laughs> I'm just going to cut off this set of things from my web of belief right now when I'm in the justification room kind of just doesn't fit with, I take it, this coherentist picture and nor need it. You just need to say, remain impartial, which is these particular parts of my web of belief do not alone determine the outcome of my investigation. So I think that kind of stuff will let you get the discussion you're having and perhaps in a way which fits with the coherentism more nicely. Yes, I mean, I'll take that as a suggestion also. Yeah, we right. I mean, we both agree on the impartiality part, so I'm happy that this is, that this is, this is settled, not settled, but it's, it's, I think it's a good thing. Um, well, I, I, I just think that my, my worry or my understanding would be, I, we would need to have the, we, would, we need to do the empirical argument reconstruction and see how these different, because, because different beliefs are, you know, web of beliefs are more, more closely and not less closely related. With some, some it's very hard to tell how and what. So in that sense, I just want to do then the argument because I'm not against what you're saying. I want to see how exactly they are and where they are, if this is possible in any way. Yeah, there are great examples in their literature. Okay, okay. great. Thank you. We're we done? Yes. Thank you all again. Five minutes break, right?